Hello everyone and welcome to the deck guide for the Royal Flush Winged Dragon of Ra deck. So, as you've seen from the duels, this deck is very very capable of killing opponents out of nowhere and is a whole lot of fun to play. Plus you get to play a little bit of poker as we go along. So, I'm going to go through the whole deck with you. I do want to point out as a disclaimer, I have modified this slightly from when I climbed. I made two changes. I took out two copies of Light Sworn Wolf because ultimately they weren't actually good enough for the deck and they ended up clogging your hand a little bit and I replaced them with uh, two cards, which is one copy of uh, Perform Age Flame Eater and another copy of Drawn Lockbird. I'll cover the choice and reasoning behind that as I go through this deck profile. But before we get started, I do want to say if you want to make sure that you catch the combo video coming out later this week and any other great content for helping you take unique decks all the way up to the highest ranks of Platinum, please subscribe to this channel and if this content's good to you, just shoot us a like and let us know in the comments down below what you would change in this deck or how you're getting on if you've built this deck. So the overall concept of this deck is that we are trying to summon the Winged Dragon of Ra for an extremely large number of attack points and attack our opponent for game. There's a lot of ways for us in this deck to get there and the main engines that we are using is the Perform Age engine, uh, allowing us to get a lot of consistency and quick special summons. And also the Poker Knights, which is Queen's Knight, Jack's Knight, and King's Knight. Uh, there's a bunch of new cards that came out for the Poker Knights, most notably the Joker's Straight. This card is absolutely insane. It lets you summon all three knights, which is going to be Queen's, King's, and Jack, straight from the deck, which incidentally gives us our free tributes for the Winged Dragon of Ra. And then at the end of each turn, if this card's in the graveyard, we can shuffle back a Light Warrior monster to add it back to our hand. So this deck kind of dumps all of its resources to the graveyard and then starts reloading the deck up and then you can just play for your resources again. You know, this assumes that the game goes longer than uh, two turns because you are going to be attacking with an extraordinarily large amount of attack points the first opportunity that you get. Firstly, I'm going to go over the hand traps for the deck since this is our primary forms of interaction with our opponent. And it's the area where you have flexibility depending on what is going on uh, in the metagame. If there's a shift, these are the areas that you're going to want to start with. So first and foremost, I'm playing three copies of Draw and Lockbird. This card is very, very strong in... It's actually kind of an awkward card because in, in the matchups where it's good, it's amazing. In the matchups where it's bad, it is completely useless. So this is one that you can potentially flex into DD Crow uh, as well. Um, I'm mostly using this against Drytron because I'm a go second deck my biggest fear is playing into a Drytron player who has set up a Herald of Ultimateness or a Herald of Perfection preventing me from being able to play any of my cards especially when I have so many cards that are two card combos and not really any one card starters that make my opponent that I can basically leave until last activate uh, in order to full combo after my opponent's playing for their resources but Drone Lockbird it will stop the Drytron player going for any of their combos because it turns off uh, Cyber Angel Benton and all the Novas after they've done their first search and forces people to stop in suboptimal positions. It's unfortunately very useless against Eldlick or something like that, but, you know, our deck is actually pretty good at playing through uh, Eldlick as it is, so we take a little bit of a liability that draw is great in some matchups and bad in others, but if you're finding on your ladder experience that you're running into some trouble, feel free to change this one up for one of the other hand traps such as DD Crow, uh, which is actually very good against Eldlick and also quite good against, deceptively good against the Drytron decks. So I only play the one copy of Maxi. This is a Go Second deck. I'm not a fan of playing Maxi in Go Second decks because the biggest strength of Maxi is you want to set up a really oppressive field and force your opponent to play into it. And ultimately Maxi, when you're going second, uh, it's great if, yeah, you get to draw a bunch of cards, your opponent gets to decide exactly how many cards that's going to be. But the thing with this deck is that we do not want to draw too many of our knights. Doing so massively reduces the power of our Joker's straight card. Now, because of this, we only play the one max C, and a main reason for this is that we can also prevent an opponent's max C with Crossout Designator. But it's actually... Maxi is deceptively not that good against us because a lot of our cards are normal summons, but they can trick your opponent into thinking that you're doing lots of special summoning. So they actually only get like one or two cards off Maxi when you are threatening lethal, which means you've got a pretty good chance of getting through. We play two copies of Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring. 
This is great against uh, opponents' maxis if we need to, and it's also good against other opponents setting up. It doesn't end the turn quite as often as Draw and Lockbird, but it's also the card that we don't want to see played against us the most, and we have our Crotite Designator, and we have two just in case we draw one to make sure that we can negate the Ash Blossom. But essentially, how powerful our deck is mostly goes around how easily we play around Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Now, I'm going to be talking about that a lot in the combo guide, so be sure to check that video out. I will just go through the deck here, and then specific game scenarios and all that kind of stuff, and then how to play certain hands and situ out of situations. You're going to want to check the combo video out. That's it for... No, we've got one more copy of a hand trap, and we've got Nibiru. Uh, Nibiru is a little bit of a pain in this deck, uh, because we do summon at least three times, and in some cases uh, when we get to five, we don't want our fifth summon of Winged Dragon of Ra to get tributed for Nibiru. That is always pretty awful. So we play we play the one copy, it does catch some people off guard in some matchups, and it also target for Crossite Designator to let us play through our combos. So the first engine, our Knight engine, with Queen's Knight, King's Knight, and Jack's Knight, and also two copies of Joker's Knight, we play these ratios very intentionally. We do not want to play free of any. Unlike real poker, actually having a pair of jacks in your opening hand is one of the worst hands you can possibly get out of this deck. In fact, in the earlier versions, I had this deck down to about 40 cards. I put it up to 60 to further decrease the chances I could possibly draw these knight cards. Also to abuse the fact that that grass looks greener is legal in free copies, but that's neither here nor there. So all of these knights are two copies only, and we can't cut it down as low as one because we need to have at least one queen in our deck and then one of either Jack's knight or King's knight to resolve Joker's straight. So we got to play, this is the bare minimum we can play, and going any higher than this would start causing our deck to have uh, some issues. So we kind of want to avoid that. The other card we play from our, our Knight's Engine, Poker Knight's Engine, is the Joker's Wild. This card is insanely good. The only reason I'm only playing one copy in this deck is because we are trying to go second, and ultimately this card is absolutely outstanding when you go first. It lets you send a card from your deck, a uh, spell from your deck to the graveyard that lists Queen's Knight, King's Knight, and Jack's Knight on it, and then it copies that card, and then at the end phase you can add it back to your hand by shuffling a light warrior monster in your graveyard back into your deck. So this is very important, which I'll go through a little bit in the deck profile, but a lot more in the combo guide about shuffling your cards back and managing your resources. But I would be playing, if I wanted to build a go-first version of this deck, three copies of Joker's Wild would be the first card in any Poker Knights deck. This card is absolutely insane. Uh, moving on, we've got our Joker's Knight, which uh, cosplays as any of the knights by sending one from your deck to the graveyard. And then during the end phase, you can return it to your hand by shuffling a Light Warrior back into your deck. So... This is really, really good because it can pretend to be Queen's Knight, and then you can normal summon King's Knight and get Jack's Knight. That then lets you have two level fives to overlay into Constellar Pelides, uh, and it also a special summon of 2,000 attack, which can be quite relevant for when we're trying to tribute summon for the Winged Dragon of Ra as well. And it's overall a pretty good card. It's not good enough for us to play three copies of it because we're not playing face card fusion. Earlier versions of this build did play face card fusion, and then I played some of the other Poker Knight cards, but ultimately that was getting in the way of my core game plan, which this entire deck is built around OTKing the opponent with either the Winged Dragon of Ra or the double or nothing OTKs with number 39 Utopia. If it's not broken, don't fix it. That's what I learned from the Utopia deck early that we featured a couple of weeks ago. So the next part of the deck uh, is the Performage engine. So we're playing three copies of Performage Damage Juggler. Uh, this card is really, 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 really good, especially when you've got people in the format playing the DD Dynamite deck. In fact, there is a bit of a problem with bots playing that deck, and that's the reason we only play 13 cards in the extra deck. Uh, I would 100% be playing 15. However, as long as DD Dynamite is a legal deck in Master Duel, your extra deck cannot contain 15 cards because well, 13 is the maximum you can contain because then your opponent's two dd dynamites cannot ftk you and a lot of the bots will see that it can't ftk you and then it will concede the game immediately giving you a free win but 
Beyond that, uh, before mage damage juggler is very good against any kind of burn deck because you can just discard it to negate the burn damage. But you can also negate battle damage with this card as well, which means it's deceptively hard for your opponent to OTK you back or when they push all in and they think they've got it. You've got access to damage jugglers and it's not once per turn. No, hold on a sec. Yeah, it's the banish effect isn't once per turn, but you can actually discard it to prevent damage multiple times. So this card's also a massive consistency card as well. We can banish it from the graveyard to search our deck for any of the perform mages we're playing. We're playing three different perform mages uh, and it gets sent to the graveyard quite a lot by either you discarding it or when you activate that grass looks greener and so you'll always have like additional resources for special summons or other bits and pieces that you're going to need in order to complete your free tributes for the Winged Dragon of Ra or just getting through various XC's shenanigans that we'll be covering as I go through this deck profile. A card that a lot of you uh, have played competitive Yu-Gi-Oh are probably not familiar with is Performage Flame Eater. So this card you can discard to protect you from any kind of burn damage, which means it's another card that turns down the pressure that a DD Dynamite deck will put on you, uh, because you can just make that effect damage zero. You'd think I'd be able to go up to 15 cards when I'm playing three copies of uh, Damage Juggler and Flame Eater. Unfortunately, you will find those hands where you don't draw either, and then the DD Dynamite deck will just FDK you. It's such a consistent deck. Absolute plague on the game at the moment. So even if I'm playing 60s, I'm playing 13 cards. That should tell you how ridiculous uh, things are. But that aside, Flame Eater has an effect where if you normal summon it, uh, you can deal 500 damage to each player. It also triggers if it's special summon, and you can special summon this card if you would take damage. So there's times when, for example, Trick Clan can come back and you can summon this reduce your damage to zero, deal 500 to each player. You get locked into performing special summons only for the rest of the turn, but then you're just one normal summon away from being able to put a Winged Dragon of Ra down. So this card is actually very, very good. It is a part of a two card pair that leads to uh, an o a two card OTK, which is essentially perform a Flame Eater and Guardian Slime. Uh, whenever you take damage, you can special summon the Guardian Slime and then Guardian Slime has a very easy route which i'll show you guys in the combo video to otk from as soon as it's in all you have to do is get it in play or discard it uh yeah all you have to do is get it in play actually and then it's a then it's an otk from from there very very easy to perform as well so our perform mage flame eater it gives us extra ways to summon that and it also gives us a little bit of protection from some of the dirtier decks on the rank ladder the next card we're playing three copies of before Mage Hat Tricker. You could probably get away with only playing two copies of this if you wanted to go up to a third Ash Blossom or something like that. But this card hasn't been uh, hasn't been bad for me. As long as there's two monsters on the field, including your opponent, you can just special summon this card. And that's a very, very powerful fact. There's a level four that you can special summon. It is unfortunately an Earth monster, which means it can't be used as material for a Star Liege Pally Dynamo. That comes up quite a lot. Uh, so that's worth keeping in mind. But it also prevents you from taking burn damage so it means that those kinds of decks aren't going to hassle you so much so it's very very good you're mostly you're just pretty much using this as a extender to make more rank fours uh for you when you're using your xe engine and of course we play one perform age trick clown if this is sent to the graveyard by that grass looks greener or as a xe material you can bring back a perform age monster it becomes zero zero and you take a thousand damage Key thing with that is you take a thousand damage, which means you can then summon Guardian Slime. Uh, it's also basically gives you a lot of materials for XE summons, and it's a light monster, so it can be used as a material for Star Leech Pally Dynamo, which means you've got even more options in this deck to OTK the opponent. The next card we're playing three copies of is Fairy Tale Snow. This started as one, went to two, and then went to three, and I was thinking to myself, I was crazy for ever playing less than three copies of this card. This card is broken. Like, if this deck wasn't called the Winged Dragon of Ra, it would be the Fairy Tale Snow deck. It's a little bit tricky in this version of the deck with the Poker Knights because you've got to manage your graveyard resources so carefully. So you have to do a lot more fault than if you're playing it in, say, a zombie version where it's just don't banish Mizuki and you're probably okay. But Fairy Tale Snow, can, you can keep bringing back from the graveyard. It's not once per turn by banishing seven other cards from your hand, field, or graveyard. And when it comes up, it flips a face-up attack position. Well, not even attack position. It's a face-up monster. You can turn it face down defense position. Very good. It also flushes Omni Negates uh, because they have to respond to this. So 
say your opponent has a just odd ice vortex dragon you normal summon this target their vortex dragon if they don't negate it the vortex dragon goes face down and then you don't have to worry about that negate for the rest of the turn you can also chain to its own effect it's not once per chain so this means that if your opponent tries to call by the grave it you can just banish another seven cards and get it back it's very 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 strong and is one of the reasons that this deck is quite as powerful as it is is on the back of fairy tale snow we play two copies of uh Godarla, the mystery dust kaiju this is specifically we play the wind one over any of the other kaijus because we can summon this if our opponent controls the wind barrier statue this is also another way of us playing around the drytron matchup uh, because we can tribute the herald of perfection out of herald of ultimateness and that gives us some room to actually play but this also leaves a monster in attack mode that's very easy to attack over with the Winged Dragon of Ra for us to win the game. So we can actually create a liability for our opponent by leaving this in attack mode, even if they put the rest of their monsters in defense or set themselves up in a way where you're not going to be able to get a single attack through. We can always punish them with the Godarla. We play one copy of the Winged Dragon of Ra, and you get bonus points if you're playing a Royal Rare version. So this card, unfortunately, is incredible incredibly vulnerable to disruption while your opponent can't respond to it when it's been summoned after it's been summoned you're going to be worried about things like infinite impermanence and effect failure and there's a lot of things that go wrong and you will pay all of your life points down to just 100 uh, so you're going to be in a very vulnerable position after you resolve this card you do have the other effect where you can pay a thousand life points to target one monster on the field and destroy it but Ultimately, we're not doing that in this deck. That's an effect that you're going to use if you summon this through Sphere Mode, which was in an earlier version of the deck and is something worth experimenting with. But I generally find that the problem with Sphere Mode is whenever I gave it to the opponent, I was never getting it back. And there were times when my opponent would only summon two monsters and it just kind of felt like a dead card in my hand. So this is our main OTK engine. And I'm going to talk about how you're going to do that in the combo video. And I'll cover it a little bit here when I get through the rest of the cards. My favorite card printed is Guardian Slime. And I literally went through the entire card pool of Master Duel to figure out how I could get this into my hand as frequently as possible. Unfortunately, there is only one card that I found that would work, which if I recall is a normal spell. It's quite a new card actually, if I just... And it was an ultra, no, it was a super rare in Master Duel. And it was this one. Yes, uh, Piri Reyes map. So this card I would 100% play free copies of if it didn't half my life points. And the biggest problem with that is, well, it also negates the effect of a monster until you normal summon it. So there's, that's a second problem. But if I pay half my life points, I can't kill them with the Winged Dragon of Ra. So that's unfortunate. So I was looking for any ways to get this into my hand. And there's not really a lot. The way this card works is if you take battle damage or effect damage, you can special summon it from your hand. Uh, during damage calculation, if it battles an opponent's monster, you can just make your defense become their attack, so that the attack is going to bounce off of it uh, during that damage calculation only. Uh, its other effect, which is the main thing, reason we're playing it, is if it's sent from the hand or filled to the graveyard, we can add one spell or trap from our deck to our hand that specifically lists the Winged Dragon of Ra in its text. So the problem with its first effect, uh, the sorry, the protecting itself by changing its defense effect is that's only once per turn so if your opponent has three monsters they attack you summon this they attack you block the attack the third attack will kill this card but that aside the searching your deck for a card that mentions the winged dragon of Ra, the only one that we're playing is ancient chant i did play blaze accelerator not blaze accelerator blaze cannon in an earlier version of this deck but it turned out that that wasn't good enough so the only one we play and the only one we need is ancient chant and we can get it out of our deck just by making sure that this gets discarded, which we're going to be doing quite a lot with either Joker Straight, or we summon it with Performage Flame Eater. This is actually a lot stronger is when you just normal summon the Flame Eater and then drop the Guardian Slime. But it's always pretty stylish when you can get your free Knights and summon the Winged Dragon of Ra off of the back of that. Uh, the next cards we're going to go over are the spell lineup. So Harpy's Feather Duster, I've covered this before in other deck profiles, but I'm always a fan of playing one copy. Yes, there are going to be matchups where this isn't good, but whenever you fail, face down an Eldlick player, or even if you're looking at Tri Brigade Zodiac and you just need to get rid of the spell and traps, just to make sure that your opponent doesn't have interaction, you're always going to want a Harpy's Feather Duster. 
just write off the matches where it's bad and accept that those happen every now and again. In a best of one format, Harpy's Feather Duster is too good not to play. We played one copy of Monster Reborn because Marek did it, so it must be good. Uh, but in all seriousness, the main reason that we played this is so that we can special summon the Guardian Sun from our graveyard. And then we can make a Wing Dragon a Raw. So in a backwards way, we can essentially use Monster Reborn to get access to our Wing Dragon of Ra OTK. Which is a lot of fun. And Monster Reborn also occasionally gets something nasty out of your opponent's graveyard. And you can just swing it at them. In case they were foolish to leave a Black Cluster Soldier and the game went on for a few turns or whatever. We play one copy of Foolish Burial. Foolish Burial can send a lot of great cards to the graveyard. Namely, Fairytale Snow. But you can also send the Damage Juggler, and then you can banish the Damage Juggler to get the Flame Eater, and then summon the Flame Eater to pair with your Guardian Slime. Uh, you can Foolish Burial a Joker's Knight uh, if you've got a uh, if you need to get normal uh, not normal monsters light warrior monsters sorry back into your deck. So it's quite a very it's a very flexible card in this deck, and um, your opponent very rarely play their own copies of Ash Blossom and Joy Spring on it, but it gives us a lot of power. And a lot of flexibility but depending on what our hand is to when we resolve this card so i'm a huge fan of this uh, even though we are playing that grass looks greener which sends a lot of cards to the graveyard this card is very very good i'll cover left arm offering second so the main card the main spell card of this deck and probably should have got to this in the very earliest stages of this video is that grass looks greener so if we have more cards in our deck than our opponent does we can send cards from the top of our deck to the graveyard so that our deck size matches theirs now, this is absolutely insane, especially when so many of our cards have graveyard effects uh, that we want to take advantage of. We send a huge number of cards to the graveyard, and of course, all of our knights, uh, we can put them back in the deck to start adding these cards back to our hand in the end phase, so that if the games are going on long, we've kind of got that inevitability where we are going to have more resources available to us than the opponents. And it's basically your opponent is forced to Ash Blossom this card, they have to stop you resolving this or the game becomes significantly harder for the opponent to win. This card is so good, we are playing three copies of Left Arm Offering in the event that our opponent plays Ash Blossom on this, banish the rest of our hand and just play it, slam down the second one. Even with zero cards, the way that this deck works is that you're still going to be in a very confident position to win the game by throwing out the rest of your hand. You do have to be a little bit careful to make sure you don't, for example, banish two knights because then we can't resolve our Joker straight, but... Left arm offering is really, really good. 90%, 99% of the time we're going for that grass looks greener. But there are times when you might be in already in a winning position and you just want to grab a Harpy's Feather Duster. Or even more stylish when you grab the Monster Reborn to pair with your Guardian Slime for an OTK. Uh, the next card we're playing two copies of is Lightning Storm. These are copies two and three of Harpy's Feather Duster. But there are times when it comes up as a neat little situational regeki. The problem with this card is a lot of people have, are built changing their play style. So they're putting their monsters in defense mode. So you're seeing things like Utopic Futures, which you couldn't kill with Lightning Storm anyway, but things like Barrier Statue and all that, it all goes in defense mode, and Lightning Storm can't clear those cards up. Regeki would be a better choice. Unfortunately, Regeki is pretty awful in most matchups, so we can't really justify playing Regeki at the moment. And Lightning Storm is very good against Tri-Brigade Zodiac, where their link monsters are forced into attack position anyway. I'm a huge fan of this card. I can't recommend going up to free in this particular deck. Uh, there are other decks where I definitely play free copies of it, but this unfortunately isn't the one. That and when our monster opponent leaves a monster in attack mode, we're mostly running over it for a million damage. So we want to incentivize our opponent putting their monsters in attack mode, and uh, this card takes away all of those options. So we don't really ever want to be destroying our opponent's monsters. Ancient Chant. This card is nuts i absolutely love this card so you can add the wing dragon of Ra from your deck or your graveyard to your hand now because we can get our wing dragon of Ra out of our graveyard we only need to play one copy of the wing dragon of Ra. if that was the only text on this card we'd be playing three copies of it but it has another little spicy effect that makes this card absolutely brilliant so you can banish it from the graveyard and then when you you get an extra normal summon essentially and you can tribute summon uh the wing dragon of Ra. And when you do, its original attack and defense become the combined original attack and defense of the monsters tributed for its summon. This means that you get the extra normal summon so that you can then, for example, summon the guardian, special summon two monsters, tribute for guardian slime, 
uh, send the guardian slime to the graveyard make ancient egyptian god slime is the fusion basically a special summon requirement instead of fusion summoning search your deck for ancient chant play ancient chant banish ancient chant you've got winged dragon of Ra. tribute ancient egyptian god slime gain three fires and attack pay all your life points attack over them ancient chant also means that we can tribute our free joker's knights so that's going to be uh 1600 plus 1500 that's uh, what's that? 3100 plus 19. So we get like a 5,000 attack window, essentially. Very important attack bracket to keep in mind. Is that essentially means that we can one-shot our opponent if their monsters are 5,000 or less attack. Huge fan of this card. I really wish I could play the other raw cards. I will cover when I get to the end of this list uh, some of the cards that didn't make it honorable mentions and why. But for all intents and purposes... We would not be playing this deck if Ancient Chant wasn't a card. That was one of the things that inspired me. Actually, Guardian Slime was the inspiration, and I was like, I have to make this card work. Ancient Chant is then probably my second favorite card. We play three copies of Joker straight because this just summons three monsters to the field. Uh, it gives us two level fours for our rank four toolbox. It does have an unfortunate drawback that you can only special summon Light Warrior monsters from the extra deck for the rest of the turn, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, and then some of the combos I'll explain why this is a bit of an issue or reasons that you need to play around this It is an effect that applies for the rest of the turn So you can do all your special summons before that then you can play this But another really cool thing about this is it fishes for ash blossom and joy spring Your opponent is seldom gonna let you have free monsters uh, For nothing, especially if you're dis it, when you discard this and you don't discard the card until it resolves So you're not gonna be two for one when you play this and then during the end phase, you can shuffle a Light Warrior monster in the graveyard back into the deck to add it back to your hand, so it means you can do it all again next turn. Cool thing with this, and along that also applies to Joker's Knight and Joker's Wild, is it says a Light Warrior monster. It doesn't say one of the Poker Knights. So you can actually put resources such as number 39 Utopia, uh, Constellar Pelides, Isolde, all of these kind of Light Warrior monsters. No, kind of, they are. You can put them back in your deck and you can take advantage of them later. I think there's a lot more room I could do of exploring with this deck. Like, this is a very... I'm very happy with the way the list came out. But if I wanted to expand and grow on this, there's definitely room. There's different ways that you could do it. And I'm a huge fan of Joker Straight. Joker Straight is an excellent card. And really fixes a lot of the problems with the Poker Knights. Yeah, it also means that if your opponent does something that would then prevent you from special summoning. Or re restrict your special summoning. Uh, we'll say Summon Limit. Uh, your opponent, yeah, slam sign summon limit. We've got options to summon just two knights. Well, special summon one, normal summon the second one. Or we can choose not to. If our opponent does something we don't like, we just special summon the queen, and we don't normal summon the king. One copy of double or nothing. I hate playing this card in the deck, but it gives us so many ways to OTK our opponent. And we have a lot more ways of doing it in this deck uh, over any attack monsters, literally any monster you can target. But I'll cover that a little bit more when we get to the extra deck. The power ceiling of your deck goes up significantly by playing this card, but at the same time, your opening hands uh, entail a risk for playing this card. So, keep that in mind. Called by the Grave is a card I... is a bit awkward in this deck, because if you want to play Left Arm Offering, you have to banish your hand as a cost, and then you don't have access to Called by the Grave, and you can't set cards during the turn that you play Left Arm Offering. So, it's a little bit awkward. I'd ideally like to be able to negate my opponent's Ash Blossom when I play Left Arm Offering. However, I can't do that. But it works very well with that Grass Looks Greener. Or if you want to resolve a Joker straight, you can just banish your opponent's Hand Trap of Choice from the graveyard. It's pretty good. Potentially, cross Eyed Designator is a little bit better. But that's up to you guys to make a preference call. I already had the Call by the Graves in my collection. And it's a card I'm quite familiar with. So I quite enjoy playing it. Even if it is a little bit more awkward in this deck. But you could definitely cut this one for one copy of cross Eyed Designator. Or even take out this uh, third copy of Drawn Lockbird for cross Eyed Designator if you like. Play two copies of cross Eyed Designator. So this card is really cool because we play a lot of hand traps that are commonly played across other decks. Such as Nibiru, Ash Blossom, Maxi. Uh, we can also negate things like opponents Lightning Storms. Or their Harpy Feather Duster if they're coming after us. Or even our opponents Forbidden Droplets depending on what cards they discard for it. Or even Called by the Grave. It gives you a lot of cards that you can interact with. Now, a cool thing with this is that you can preemptively play it. You don't have to chain it to a card. 
that's activating. So we can, for example, play this, banish an Ash Blossom, and then we can play that grass looks greener quite safely, knowing our opponent cannot activate Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring because we've already negated it for the rest of the turn. We play three copies of Forbidden Droplet. Forbidden Droplet is... It's very... It's actually extra powerful in this deck. It's our way of also playing into Drytron because it gives us a way of negating their Herald of Ultimateness. It can let us play into some other games where opponents have multi on the negate. And the cool thing about this is all of our all of our Joker cards essentially add themselves back to our hand. And then it gives us one copy of each type so our opponent can't respond to it with any of cards. So we can negate in half the attacks of three monsters our opponent controls and make sure our opponent can't respond to it in any way. And then we're going to add those three cards back to our hand during our end phase. So it has extra synergy in this deck. Um, overall, it's just incredibly powerful. It also gives you ways to play it around very fun dragon or what is it true king of all calamities uh, the, the ocg name is vfd for anybody who's maybe a little bit newer to the game that's uh stumbled across this video and um, wants to understand how much people should hate that card and forbidden droplet is a great answer to that even if they don't shotgun it in the main phase so they don't activate it immediately because they're trying to wait for you to play another card to activate it so that they can't get caught by infinite impermanence this card doesn't have that problem, so we can go ahead and negate and turn off the the drag, the true king of all calamities. Joker's Wild, I've kind of already covered this card, but it pretends to be Joker straight every single time. So we activate this, send this to the graveyard, and then we have to send another card from our hand to the graveyard. Uh, could be Guardian Slime, could be anything, and then we get to summon our three knights ready for our next turn. And the cool thing is, is that the restriction that we can't summon from the extra deck except for Light uh, Warrior Monsters will disappear if we do that in our opponent's turn. Problem with this is it can only be used in the main or battle phase, so if you set it up uh, your stops so that when your opponent goes to end their second main phase or their main phase to go to their end phase, you can activate this card. Your opponent might then go, ah, okay, now I'll make some plays. Like They may have just been willing to pass, but after you've committed this card, they could do some other stuff. And it has come up to me in quite a few games where that's been a problem. Uh, you can also just do this during your turn as well. Um, which is worth keeping in mind depending on the game situation. You need to really look at what your opponent's done and then figure out if it's worth firing off in your turn or if you should wait in, or if you should do it in their turn or if you should fire it off in your. So that's going to be it for the main deck. So now let's move over to the extra deck. We play one copy of Egyptian God Slime. So we're never actually fusion summoning this. We summon it by tributing a Guardian Slime because we can special summon it by tributing a level 10 Aqua Monster with zero attack. This card can be treated as one of three tributes for the tribute summon of a monster. It cannot be destroyed by battle, and your opponent has to target the Ancient Egyptian God Slime with any card effects that they have. So a cool thing you can do is if you can keep your Ancient Egyptian God Slime, I say Ancient Egyptian, it's just Egyptian God Slime, if you can keep this card in play when you summon the Wind Dragon of Ra, if your opponent has infinite impermanence or anything like that, they can only play it on Egyptian God Slime. Kind of a cool interaction, but rarely comes up, because most often you're going to end up distributing this to give yourself... 3,000 attack on your Ra uh, base with Ancient Chant, and then you're going to pay 7,900 life points and kill your opponent over anything that has 2,900 or less attack. Excellent card and is part of the uh, one card uh, OTK, which is as soon as we send, we just send this to the graveyard to summon this, which then lets us activate the effect of Guardian Slime to search our deck for Ancient Chant. Uh, we can play the Ancient Chant, get a Ra, banish the Ancient Chant, then tribute the Guardian Slime, the Egyptian God Slime, and then summon Ra with a huge amount of attack points. Very, very good card and worth playing one copy of. It's not worth playing multiple copies because the turn that we do it, we're generally winning. We play number 39 Utopia. This is our second way of OTKing an opponent. Uh, there's a lot of games where you can just go for the Utopia and Star Liege Pally Dynamo OTK. And that may be sometimes easier to get through and less risky than committing all of your plays into a Winged Dragon of Ra. So the trick with it is, is because we can special summon so many monsters, because we can get uh, three monsters essentially off of Joker straight, uh, we can summon the Pali uh, Dynamo, which is a light warrior monster. And we can, for example, use a Hat Tricker and a another card, our normal summon, and then make Utopia. And then we can go in, well, we can make Utopia double, uh, number 39 Utopia double, activate the effect, get ourselves double or nothing, 
summon number 39 Utopia, make any attack position monster our opponent controls zero and negate its effects, then attack over it for 10,000. So that's going to win the game uh, pretty much against anything uh, unless you can't target the opponent's monster. Very easy to do and something to keep an eye out for a lot of time. You can even give them the Kaiju, which you can make zero and then get the Utopia double to nothing OTK over that. So that's one of the skills of this deck is kind of looking for, am I going for a raw kill? Am I going for a Utopia kill? And you're going to be trying to look for those windows whilst also managing all of your graveyard resources to not cause yourself problems later on in the game. But as I've said before, all of that will be in the combo video a little later this week. Next card we play a copy of is Abyss Dweller. This card is very good if we get put to go first. Unfortunately, we can't summon it if we activate Joker straight, but there's times when you can summon it with Fairy Tale Snow, you can do things with Flame Eater. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's times when just setting this up and then it's stopping your opponent's graveyard can cause them problems if they put you on first. So it's, it's a very, very good card. I've always loved Abyss Dweller. Always finds a place in decks where you can summon it. We play one copy of uh, Stellanite Dialtros. This is this is okay. Uh, it, for the most part, it gives you ways of destroying your opponent's spells or traps, and it's a light warrior. It does require three level fours, so you do have to, if you play Joker straight, for example, you still have to give up a Perform Mage Hat Tricker. There's a lot of resources to put into it, but it can go after your opponent's spells and traps, and your opponent can't uh, uh, respond to it after its normal summon. So... It's an okay option. There are better options I wish I could play, or if you've guys got thoughts, by all means check them in the comments below. But this isn't this is an okay card for the extra deck. It it has there are times where you'll you'll go to it to and it, it gets you out of situation. Minerva the Exalted Light Sworn. If only she was a light warrior, this deck would be disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Not to say that it is not already ridiculous, but this card is it would be a little bit better if it was a warrior. So you detach one material from this card, and you set the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard. Then you draw cards equal to the number of Light Sworn cards sent to the graveyard by this card effect. Originally, I was playing a huge Light Sworn engine instead of the Perform Ages, and it ended up being too clunky, and I didn't like it, so I took it out. So you're never, you're never going to resolve this effect where you draw extra cards. Or even the second effect, where when it's destroyed, you send the top three cards of your deck to the graveyard, and then you can destroy cards up to the number of Light Sworn cards. This original version of the deck played one copy of Raiden, two copies of Wolf. And the cool thing with Raiden is he's a light warrior, so you can send him back to the deck with Joker's Straight, Joker's Wild, or Joker's Knight. Uh, that ultimately, it wasn't good enough, and there was a lot of hands where I was just like, why do I want this Raiden, other than it's sending cards to the graveyard and feeding a fairy tale snow. So this card essentially just gives you six cards that you can send from the top of your deck to the graveyard. Uh, if you're forced on going first, very, very good for doing tricks like that. Next card we play a single copy of is Tornado Dragon. Uh, this card is an all-round excellent answer to a lot of problematic spells or traps that your opponent's going to have, or if you just need to clear up that back row before you start comboing off. Uh, I'm a huge fan of this. You can't summon it if you've played Joker straight, but anytime you can just summon two level fours, you've got that removal option that we didn't have to draw out of our main deck in order to deal with what our opponent has. So all-around good, good generic rank four. Double or nothing. I've already covered that since we're playing Utopia double, and... Well, the Utopia and the Utopia uh, double or nothing card so that we can get our 10k attacks over opponent's monsters. And then we play one copy of Constellopolides. Our Joker Jax Knight is level 5. You can pair it with a Joker's Knight to make the Polides. Surprisingly disruptive. Just detach a material during either player's turn, target one card on the field and return it to the hand. It forces our opponent to play around it and it's something we can just sit in defense mode to... To harass our opponents if they put us on first uh if we if we go first and we've made our first rank four and then we've got a jacks knight left over we can just put that in defense isolde isolde is good but the problem with this card is that when you add the warrior to your hand you can't activate the effects of that warrior in the same turn this card would be so good if i could but it'd probably be broken in a lot of other decks if you could do that it's a good link to ultimately in a lot of a lot of times this is kind of not going to be a go-to play but you always have the option to make sure that you always have access to uh, Joker's Knight, uh, which is a very strong card. It's just, yeah, the, the fact that you can't use the Warrior in the same turn makes this card a little bit less good than you'd hope. We play one copy of Nightmare Phoenix. Uh, this is, again, to go after opponent's spells and traps. 
we can discard cards. Our discards are free in this deck, essentially, because we're getting back our Joker's Straight, our Joker's Knight, and our Joker's Wild. So very good at picking cards off. I'd love to fit a Nightmare Unicorn. Maybe that would come in instead of the Talonite. Knight. It's a, it's, a, it's a good consideration. But, yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of Nightmare Phoenix. Uh, again, it's Spell and Trap removal that you don't have to draw. The next little cheeky combo that we put in the deck is IP Masquera and the Crusadia Avermax, or the Mech Knight Crusadia Avermax. What you can do in this deck is summon two monsters, send them to the graveyard to summon IP Masquera. Uh, then we can play Joker Straight, get three monsters, and then we can make one more special summon. We can summon Constellopolides, or we can summon Zolde. And then in the opponent's turn, we can use the IP Masquera to summon Mech Knight uh, Crusadia Avermax. This card is a huge pain for the opponents to get through uh when it's linked summon the opponent can't target with card effects and their monsters can't uh, cannot target monsters other than this card for attacks and then during battle phase uh once per battle so if your opponent attacks three times you can use the effect three times during damage calculation if you're battling a special summon monster you just gain the attack of the opponent's monster uh during damage calculation so this card is not easy to attack over and it even if they do get rid of it you can target one card on the field and shuffle it back IP Masquera makes it even more problematic because then they cannot destroy it. So, your opponent can't Lightning Storm it, they can't Regeki, they can't use any non-targeting removal to get over it. It's not 100% a sure thing lock because the opponent might play something that lets them negate this or they could play a Kaiju and you put quite a few resources into it but it, there are some decks that just cannot, cannot answer a IP Masquera uh, Crusader Evermax. So it's a very good uh, going first option uh, depending on your opening hand. So that's going to cover the main deck. Uh, there's a couple of noticeable cards that didn't make it. Uh, yeah, cards that uh, didn't make it. So Millennium Revelation, we're not playing enough Divine Beasts, so this doesn't work. Blaze Cannon, I love this card, but it's win more. We get everything we need off Ancient Chant, and the main thing you're playing it for is your cards aren't affected by our card effects. But your opponent can just chain to this if you try and resolve it first, so it's and whenever you draw it, it just clogs your hand and does nothing. Sun God Unification. You could play it if you want to play the Immortal Wing Dragon of Ra Phoenix, which is um, this card. But ultimately, it's just it's just not good enough. I mean, it does let you, if your OTK doesn't go through, gain all the life points back. So you can try again on a future turn. But I'm not a fan of this. It takes up space in our deck that we could be doing other stuff with. Uh, this card is a trap card that doesn't advance our strategy in any way. So it's just bad. Yeah, oh, we've got the Wing Dragon of Rossphere mode. Yeah, I got a royal version of that as well. Now, there was a cool card I was playing originally for the Queen's Knight, which made this card extra good. Which was this one here. Thunder Speed Summon, because uh, you can summon a level 10 monster by tributing... Well, you can just basically tribute summon a level 10 monster. But if you control the Queen's Knight, King's Knight, and Jack's Knight, you can add one level 10 non-dark monster question mark attack so ra or sphere mode and then you can just normal summon it so a cool thing you could do is activate joker's wild copy this card because it mentions the knights then tribute summon the wing dragon ra to your opponent's side of the field from your deck on their turn although it's usually better to summon it to your side of the field because your opponent can't target the sphere mode in any way it was cool but ultimately it's just just not good enough for what we're trying to do and we can make our deck more consistent by not playing it so it was an honorable mention that just didn't make the cut arcana's knight joker eh it's just not good enough uh then we also have uh face card fusion face card fusion very very good uh because you could then there's uh there is a fusion monster the conqueror i forget his full name oh yeah idaton uh, the conquering star, conqueror star. So essentially, you could uh, face card fusion, send uh, monsters from your deck to the graveyard when you've got Jack's Knight. Uh, then this card searches for a level five or higher warrior monster from your deck and puts it into your hand, so you can get the Joker's Knight. Uh, the cool card that you could send to the graveyard to resolve that effect would have been uh, Arcana Triumph Junk Joker. But anytime I had access to this, I just wish I was doing something else when I was playing but it's something you can play around with and experiment with as well and lastly before this deck profile gets a little bit too long 
I want to cover the Imperial Bl uh, Bower. So this card is great because it gives you a lot of ways to access IP Mascara. It's very good if you want to go first. But the biggest problem is, is it fins your deck of knights very, very quickly and doesn't have an effect that puts cards back in your deck. Managing your the cards in your deck is so unbelievably important in this game, as I'll cover in the combo guide, uh, that this card was kind of conflicting with that. And I didn't want to go first anyway. And when I was going second, I had access to a lot of other ridiculous cards. So this card didn't make the cut. But if you want to mix it up and try some different things, uh, going first variants or focus more around the Utopia double sh uh, one shots, by all means, Imperial Bower is a great card for that. So guys, that is going to wrap it up for the deck guide. So as I've said before, shoot some comments down below of what you would change if you've been playing around with this or if you've got any questions, just let me know and I'll do my best to get back to you and let you know exactly why I made decisions that I did or what my thoughts are on your ideas. The next video in this series is going to be the combo guide and I'm going to go over how to pilot this deck. So even if you're a complete beginner to the game or even just this deck, I will take you from the rookie ranks all the way to platinum one on this deck. Now, as I mentioned before, it did only take me six days to get this deck all the way up. I probably could have done it faster, but I do have a full time job and I'm very much a fan of going to the gym and not living inside my house all the time. So you probably could have, I probably could have hit the rank one a lot faster than I did. But you guys can absolutely replicate that kind of success with this deck and you get to style on the opponents with Yugi's Poker Knights and then slap them with the Winged Dragon of Ra. What's not to love? Alright guys, that's going to be it for me. Uh, please subscribe to the channel if you want to see more great content. And yeah, see you for the next one. Cheers.